Hello and welcome to a new episode of The Bull Club, Conversations with Leaders. The Bull Club is a webinar series that provides valuable insights from successful investors and financial leaders from around the world. My name is Talia Blank, Social Media Manager here at eToro, and I'm happy to be your host today. Our guest today has an impressive 20-year investing career throughout the golden age of the hedge fund industry, where she rose to become the only female partner of a $25 billion hedge fund. She has written all about it in her recent book called Damsel in Distressed, the first book written on the industry by a woman and a very insightful and funny read. It's certainly a unique perspective with a lot of personal anecdotes. So without further ado, let me welcome Dominique Miel. Dominique, thank you so much for being here with us today. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm great. Good. Um, Okay, so let's jump straight in. So can you please tell us how you got into investing in the first place? What attracts you to it? Just expand on your on your history and, and how things got started for you. Well, let me start by saying that I came to investing late in life, particularly compared to um, what you see in the media, the description of hedge fund managers who started trading when they were in college or high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, It all started uh, because I was born and raised in Paris and my ambition was to be really uh, a beach bum in Tahiti. And I started looking for a job abroad. Um, I realized it wasn't quite a serious endeavor uh, to go to Polynesia for my career. And uh, the second best choice I had was to work for a bank in New York. And I took it really to see the world more than because I had any interest in finance because I didn't. Uh, And it wasn't until I got to business school and I took a few classes on portfolio management and risk management that I really thought that's an interesting uh, field of work. Uh, It's creative, it's intellectual, you make decisions. And so after my MBA, I took a job at this little scrappy place called Canyon Capital, and I ended up staying 20 years. Amazing. And turned out not to be such a scrappy uh, place after all. Not at Um, the end. Certainly not. Um, Okay. So that's a fascinating story. Um, And it just shows you never know. You never know where your career is going to take you. Um, You don't. It's, It's an adventure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'd love to hear um, about your investing process. How do, you, how do you find investments? What research uh, process do you go through? How do you decide when evaluation is attractive? Just, just talk us through uh, your process on that. So to start off, I should say that what I was trading at Canyon was distressed restructurings, bankruptcies. Um, so all things that have to do with a pretty complicated uh, process And the ideas came from multiple places, talking to a network of other investors, talking to salespeople, but also reading the news and lateral thinking about um, seeing a spike in all or a, uh, you know, new stores opening down the street. So it really came from all kinds of uh, sources. And then you got to work. And really the job, at least my job, was a lot less like what you think of trading in the media and in movies and Wall Street, you know, people on the phone uh, Mm -hmm. all day. It was more detective work. It was reading financials, calling the management teams, vendors, clients, calling other people and putting together a picture of what the situation is. Uh, So a puzzle, if you wish, where you try to put all the pieces so that looking back, you have a good sense, or at least you think you have a good Mm -hmm. sense of what's going on. That was the job. Uh Uh-huh. So, I mean, I know you you said your expertise lies in distressed debt. So why did you choose this type of high-risk investment and not um, equity, for example? For a few reasons, why is because one is because I think bonds are really corporate bonds are very interesting. They're all different. Of course, they have different rates, different maturities, but all kinds of different technical terms. And that makes it a very, um, very fun uh, financial securities to look at and to try to understand. Two, and mainly because distressed investing is really about strategy. So it's not about speed. It's not a bad reaction. It really is like, if you want to think of it as a game of risk or a game of chess, 
different pieces of the capital structure have different interests and you're trying to think about who is going to do what, what their next move is, and you're trying to position yourself uh, the best possible way to take a piece of the action. And that is the thrill of uh, bankruptcy investing. So in it for the thrill. In it for the thrill. In it, but you know, one thing that people don't talk about enough in the business of investing is how creative it is, how you need to be curious and imaginative and show ingenuity Mm -hmm. and be able to listen to people. All qualities that I think you know, they're not male or female uh, qualities. Everybody has them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you describe an investor, a hedge fund investor like that, it becomes a job that is attractive to a whole lot of people rather than sort of the stereotypical, you know, Gordon Gecko, greasy hair, Wall Street type. It is a oh. very um, fulfilling job uh, for sure. And obviously dynamic because something's new is happening every day. So you're always, you know, kept on your toes and and, and something new and exciting you around the corner. Every, every part of the day, mm-hmm. not doing anything is a decision. That mm-hmm. means you're keeping your portfolio as is. That is a very big de- decision, right? And you do that every day. Uh, that's, you know, I can't think of a, of a job that's more decision oriented uh, than, than that. Sure. I mean, that's such an exciting way to paint to paint this uh, field of work for someone who might be thinking about getting into it, for example, you know, to think of it in that kind of frame of mind is really, really fascinating. Um, so I, obviously, the capital markets are going through changes all the time. Um, so what were the biggest changes that that you've experienced um, in the investment world throughout your career? Oh, gosh, everything changed, because think about it this way, I was in the market for a span of over 20 years Mm -hmm. so i joined canyon back in 98 we didn't have cell phones we Mm -hmm. didn't have the internet was nascent um so just the way you got information you had to call up companies to get their paper uh annual statements you know so when i think of a company like etoro where the information is immediate it's Mm -hmm. free Mm -hmm. and it's unlimited that is a huge change. So information is, is part of what changed, regulations, uh, but also, and this is really more to the industry of hedge funds, um, the size and the scale of the industry uh, has changed, meaning it's grown tremendously. When I started, it was, you know, uh, hedge funds were a player, but a small player in the market. There were probably 5,000 funds and they controlled, you know, maybe 3 billion in assets. Today, there are 25,000 hedge funds controlling over 4 trillion in assets. So it's gone through a minor player, very nimble, very scrappy, as I was saying, Mm -hmm. to major institutional investors that by and large really represent the market. They're the market movers. So obviously that comes with a lot of constraints. You're not as nimble, you're not as fast, you're not as secretive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that has advantages and it has a lot of disadvantages as well. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you were saying that, um, you know, platforms like Itaro can and provide information um, on an unlimited scale. And, and it, but, but I think it also one of the differentiating factors is that it's live. You can get information right there and then. Whereas I'm sure oh, when you started, lo- there, was, oh, there, was, there was a delay. Exactly. There was a delay. First of all, you have also to to remember it's I think it would be unimaginable for some of your um, uh, of the people who are looking, but information was not equally distributed. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, no regulation, at least in the US, until something called Regulation FD that says companies need to tell the same thing to everybody Mm -hmm. before they could have a conference call with me, an institutional professional investor, and tell me something and not tell retail investors. So there was a disinformational uh, imbalance that is not there anymore. And, you know, obviously one of the huge, huge uh, changes is the rise of retail trading in the last, call it 
two, three years, mm -hmm. um, becoming a real force to reckon with. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge change and something that I think hedge funds are obviously wrestling with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because back when you were managing hedge funds, you you were the, the queen of the castle of, of all this of all this information and now the average retail investor has access to it and you know they exactly and it it makes for a, a very comical situation where when i started um we hedge funds were the small guys and we were gonna stick it to the the long you know sort of uh dodgy stayed money we were gonna show them mm -hmm. and We've become hedge funds have become those guys, and yeah. retail investors are just you know the, the tables have turned. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So it's quite interesting to see that uh, that uh, um, uh, like that switch. That switch. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So I mean, obviously. An investor's kind of worst enemy is volatility. Um, and I think you referred to crises as golden, the golden geese for investing. Um, can you share how you dealt with risk and uncertainty throughout your career? Um, I wouldn't say that volatility is the enemy of, of the investor. I would say that volatility is a measure of risk, right? It's the dispersion mm -hmm. of returns. Mm -hmm. And so any risk that's taken with a... Uh, without a commensurate return is is bad. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of the game is to get enough return per amount of risk you're taking. Mm -hmm. um, again, being a bond investor and a distressed investor, my primary job and uh, my inclination is always to look at the downside first, mm -hmm. right? Because a bond has limited uh, upside, even distressed bonds. Uh, but that's what I look at first. Uh, we are now in a situation of, for me, almost deja vu because I started in 98 uh, right in the middle of the Russian crisis. Mm -hmm. Russian had defaulted on its bonds. Yeah. There was a currency crisis that spread out to Asian country, uh, countries. And here we are today in a similar uh, situation, although caused by different things. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say also is that a single crisis is not is never as contained as you think. So I would say, make sure you think about the first and the second effect and derivatives, right? Be it oil is the first one, but then other commodity, commodities and then food prices mm -hmm. and then aircraft airlines, which is something I was trading, being stuck in Russia. Mm -hmm. wars are never as fast or uh, as as we think so um you know my way of dealing with it was to really concentrate on the scenarios that were dire mm -hmm. and see if i could get a relatively good price good entry price so that the upside was very good relative to to that downside scenario and i i read that you used the uh, decision trees a lot I'm a big fan of decision trees. They talk talk us me. through that. <laughs> um, it's it's very it's a, a very simple, almost crass method. But mm -hmm. what it is is different branches of scenarios. Um, so you know you will look at binary uh, or maybe more uh, scenarios for every company or every situation. Um, as I said, when. Uh, area that I was trading was uh, aircraft bonds. And these are topical because a lot of aircraft uh, are now stuck in Russia and the lessors can't get them back. So it would look like uh, I own those bonds. Mm -hmm. How many uh, airplanes are in Russia? Uh, zero or, or a lot. If it's a lot, then you have two more branches. What, are the, what is the likelihood of getting them back? Is it 50%? Uh, is it zero? Is it 20? If it's 50%, when do I get them back? How do they do I get them back? When I get them back, then other branches, are they still valuable? What do I do with them? And so it goes on where at the end, you have an expected value for the bond you just bought. And it gives me sort of a, a, a path to uh, potentially winning or losing mm -hmm. money 
Definitely. If you've got your vision in front of you exactly. as to where it could go. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Knowing that life is never as simple and there are twists and turns and there's invariably scenarios that you never thought of. Yeah. I feel like if we if we all made decision trees for a lot of other areas in our life, we'd, we'd do a lot better. Um, okay. So moving on a, a different, a little bit of a different trajectory here. Um, you said Canon Capital, uh, the, the hedge fund where you worked, and I guess the broader investment industry was a female free zone when you joined. Um, can you can you expand on that? You know, what were the challenges? Um, were, you, were you treated differently? I think you said also in your book that it was quite isolating. Um, talk to us about that a little bit. It is, uh, you know, sort of stubbornly um, uh, still a white male world. Uh, investing in general, but hedge funds in particular, I think the latest uh, statistics are at the senior level the percentage of women is still in the single digit. Mm -hmm. And it's quite strange because usually industries that grow tend to become more diverse. And it makes sense. Um, You know, people are the resource of hedge funds, of investing, of finance in general. So think of an industry who says, you know, to to get my resources, I'm only going to look at 50% of all capacity and choose from that pool instead of thinking, well, you know, I should choose from 100% of the available resources. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Or think about um, a company whose job is really talent management. We're in the business of ideas. Who thinks, well, I'm only going to take ideas from a very small or at least not the majority of people. Um, That's a, that is, that does not make sense in Mm -hmm. the end, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it is still by and large the case. Uh, I'm trying with my book to show that the job is fun. The job is for women. It is for minorities. It is a great thrill to work in the business. It's very lucrative. Um, and it really is, um, you make better decisions with a diverse team that's been proven academically, uh, in the corporate world. And Mm -hmm. it, it, it goes for investing as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I laughed when I saw your, your colleagues used to call you the velvet hammer. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the, of the better names. I'm sure there were some that were uh, not fit for this uh, program. Yeah. Here. Well, I mean, I guess uh, you're not such a velvet hammer <laughs> in the end. Huh? <laughs> um, and I think you said in the book that you know, even today, only um, you, you just said single digit, that 2% of, of hedge funds are run by women. And that's, you know, nearly 25 years after you started. Um, so I'd love to hear your take on, on how much has changed for female investors, uh, investors today and what still needs to happen, um, I guess, to level the playing field a little bit. Um, you know, we, we recently did a global sur- uh, female investor survey and it showed that 48% had started investing in the past two years. Um, but ha- how much uh, still, still needs to happen to bump up those? So, so we're talking about two things that are different but similar. One is that um, women as retail investors are less present than men, but that's starting to change. And I think, um, you know, the online platforms like eToro are very much helping. Mm -hmm. And the other is being a professional investor. And again, you know, in my 20 years as a hedge fund manager, I met one other female partner and it just did not ever get better Mm -hmm. uh, until really, I would say a couple of years ago, and particularly this year where um, there's at least a dozen of hedge funds starting with uh, a, a woman heading the enterprise. And that's changing um, for two reasons. Uh, One is because investors realize that it doesn't make sense to have the same people managing the money. And so they're really insisting uh, on on diversity. So that is putting great pressure on the business to Mm -hmm. change their ways. Mm -hmm. But I think internally, people are starting to really um, believe in the idea that Uh, you do better, you invest better when you have a plurality of point of views, when you have different perspectives. Uh, And women do bring one, minorities, uh, 
whatever you, you can think of foreigners, they will bring a different perspective that enriches the conversation. Uh, and that's, that's what you're uh, there to do as, as an investor. You're here to, again, uh, try to paint the best possible picture of what the situation is, where yeah. you invest, and how, uh, how the future is going to unfold. Yeah, of course, for sure. Couldn't agree more. Um, so for investors who are starting out, as many are, uh, what recommendations do you have, I guess, both for those looking um, at it as a career or, or more broadly, those new retail investors who are getting started? Because I know you said that you had, you know, when you joined Canning Capital, you had no clue about investing. And, and, and here we are today. <laughs> We've got you on the bull club as an expert at, at investing. So what, what advice could you give? I think um, a, f- a few things. One is persistence and mm-hmm. patience. Um, investing is not, in my mind, what is, again, uh, usually portrayed in the media where somebody is a genius at it as if it was sort of a, a, a God-given uh, skill. No, investing is a craft. You work at it. You get more information. You make mistakes. So be patient and be resilient, have mm-hmm. a long-term view, particularly now when you know, I'm quite worried of, about the market uh, today, as everyone should, but mistakes are unavoidable. Uh, so, and it's actually a, a good thing to make mistakes in the beginning if they are not too large. So size them properly yeah. so that mistakes, when they do happen, do not take you completely out of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so for retail investors that say, you know, use common sense, diversification, uh, low leverage, patience, long-term, uh, and, and resilience, I think uh, that's, that's what I would uh, recommend. They're not, uh, you know, it's just sort of common sense um, sure. recommendations. And for uh, uh, people who are getting in the business, yeah, it's, it's great fun. And know that there will be uh, days, again, when you lose money and feel like a complete idiot, it happens to everyone. It happens to the best investors. You won't read about it. You won't read that Ray Dalio has losing trades, but he does. Yeah. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Everybody does. And what matters yeah. is um, come back the next day and make up for it. Um, and that's yeah. a pretty good skill in life to have, to take failures and losses as business as usual, as something that oh. will happen that you have to get up from. It builds resilience, if anything, certainly. Yep. Um, so, we're, Dominique, we're nearly out of time, but I have to ask you, um, in your book, you recount being interviewed before joining Canyon as potentially the 15th employee at Amazon. Um, <laughs> do you ever ask yourself, what if? <laughs> you know, I never do. That's just, I, I am not very good at going back in time and thinking about alternative realities. I'm more of a forward kind of person having lots of balls in the air and uh, some will land, some will not. Uh, but, you know, I only look back at the past to sort of make light of it and make fun of it. But mm-hmm. um, I'm, you know, I was incredibly lucky to be at Canyon at the right time yeah. uh, and it was the right place. And, mm-hmm. you know, what else can you ask for? That's, that's pretty good already. Yeah. Well, I had to ask, but uh, I love that answer. Right place, <laughs> right time, or, you know, everything happens for a reason, however you want to spin it, but I love that. Um, so we're out of time. Dominique, thank you so much for joining us on the Ball Club today. Um, it's an inspiring story for us all. And I'd encourage everyone to read uh, your book, Damsel in Distress, which is available online at, or at your local bookstore. And we'll also put details in the notes below for people to order the book if they want um dominique thank you so much and see you again soon i hope thank you so much for having me no problem take care